specifically aimed at uh, Yaroslav students and not at the experts um, that I see here. So uh, for <laughs> um, so I propose, I propose to follow the initial uh, the initial plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it will be um, sort of a bit of an overview talk, um, just trying to mm, highlight some interesting things happening uh, with uh, Pandeva equations, uh, isomonodromy, and whatnot, with some concrete examples at the end. So um, I will begin uh, with a very brief introduction into what Pandeva equations are. And again, looking at the list of people in the audience, that makes me a little bit uneasy, but whatever. Uh, hoping for students. So um, uh, here is an example of a Pandeva equation. Okay, so called Pandeva 1. If you look at this, you notice that this is a second order ordinary differential equation, as you can see here. Um, you can also see that this equation is nonlinear because you have y square here. And uh, it's an ordinary differential equation. Uh, here, uh, we think about uh, dependent and independent variables as uh, being uh, complex. But then there are other examples like uh, here. So this is not a Pandeva equation, but it's also second order ODE and nonlinear. And uh, the definition of Pandeva equation is a little bit, um, in a way, complicated. It's not like you can write down a particular form of the equation. Um, the uh, definition comes from what is called um, a Penleve property about the singularity structure of solutions. So what happens with nonlinear equations is that um, when you have um, a solution, like for example, if you look at this first order equation, and write down a solution that's easy to do by explicit integration, you notice that constant of integration appears uh, explicitly in the equation and uh, um, that the way it appears is um, uh, this uh, solution has a branch point and the position of this branch point depends on the initial condition. So you have a singularity that uh, depends on uh, the initial value problem and not on the equation itself. And this is a nonlinear uh, phenomena. So um, this uh, point is called a movable branch point. Uh, you can also have movable essential singularity points or you can have movable uh, poles. So the Penleve property um, is the following, that if you look at the general solution of an ordinary differential equation, it should be free of movable um, or dependent on this uh, constant of integration critical points. And Penleve equations themselves are second order uh, algebraic differential equations that have this property. Um, so why uh, this property and what's the motivation behind all this. So um, um, the original motivation uh, was that uh, people wanted to construct special functions. And um, if you think about our collection of functions, some of them you obtain just by pure algebra, like uh, polynomials or uh, rational functions, you don't need anything more than that. However, if you want to look at something more, for example, if you want to look at the exponential function, right, how would you define that? What's what's the motivation behind it, right? You can write down power series, but where does the power series come from? And um, the point is that this function appears as a solution of a simplest possible first order ordinary differential equation. And the same is true for trigonometric functions, for example, hyperbolic functions. And in general, um, classical special functions of mathematical physics like Bessel, Airy, uh, Kummer, Hermit, etc. All these uh, functions that appear in a wide range of um, physical and mathematical problems, they appear as solutions of ordinary differential equations. So in other words, uh, if we want to extend our um, collection of tools or collection of functions, differential equations is a place um, to look. And 
what Pendeve and uh, his students and uh, colleagues wanted to do, they wanted to do the same for uh, nonlinear ordinary differential equations. So to construct nonlinear special functions. But uh, there are certain difficulties. For example, for uh, linear differential equations, we have well, first the superposition principle that if we find the basis in the space of solutions, any other solution can be written in terms of this basis. And also the singularity structure. We control the singularities of solutions completely by the singularities of the equation itself. Whereas as we saw by uh, this uh, group of examples, this is not the case um, in the uh, nonlinear case. So singularities of solutions can depend on this initial value problem. So, uh, and then the meaning of Penleve property is uh, an attempt to single out the equations that have a notion of a general solution that it has a corresponding algebraic uh, surface. There exists an algebraic surface of the general solution. Um, and that's related to integrability. So that's the motivation for Penleve equations. And uh, there is a well-known uh, classification scheme. So um, you can also look at first order equations that satisfy Pendeve property. And uh, there are two, and both equations are remarkable. One is the equation on the Weierstrass P function, and the other is uh, Riccati equation. Um, so when you go to second order, it turns out that uh, modular various changes of coordinates um, and also linear equations or equations that can be reduced to linear. There are six um, types or six families of ordinary differential equations that are uh, called Pendeve 1, Pendeve 2, etc., up to Pendeve 6. So, um, if you look at these equations, what do you notice? Uh, first, second order, nonlinear, have uh, some parameters. And the further down you go, the more parameters you have. It's like one parameter here, uh, four parameters here, and uh, the equation starts looking more and more complicated. And um, it turns out that, um, Um, Penleve 6 is, in a sense, a master equation. Um, and if you um, do some degeneration on uh, parameters on Penleve 6, you can get all of the other equations. Also, um, Penleve equations have uh, special solutions uh, for special values of parameters. Like uh, here, you see Penleve 6 uh, have uh, some uh, solutions that can be written in terms of uh, Gauss hypergeometric uh, function and then Coomer functions, etc., up to Airy functions uh, for um, P2. Uh, okay. Anton, you mean uh, hmm? there is some special solutions for these equations? Um, there are some special, okay, so what I mean is the following. Um, first of all, because the equations are nonlinear, if we have uh, some solutions, doesn't mean that we have uh, many solutions, right? We cannot do their linear combinations or anything like that. But um, what I mean is, is, is this, if you have a differential Pendeve equation, in general, any solution of it would be a transcendental function. But there are special values of parameters for which you can also have a special type of solution that can be written in terms of um, this uh, classical special functions, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, did, 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 did. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. All right, so we, so we have this. Okay. Then, uh, uh, 
the story of differential Pandeva equations is very classical. It's uh, over 100 years old now. Uh, and uh, discrete Pandeva equations is something much, much more recent. And um, at this point, I think about what, 30 years old. And um, they are also second order but not differential equations, but rather nonlinear recurrence relations. And um, I think originally some examples appeared in a theory of orthogonal polynomials and in uh, quantum gravity, but the name discrete Pandeva equation, uh, I think um, occurred and uh, Frank who is here can correct me, I, I think Initially, it occurred in this uh, works of Brezan, Kazakov, and Gross and Migdal, who got this recurrence relation and also then took a continuous limit to um, and showed that it uh, goes to the differential Pandeva equation. Hence, the name discrete Pandeva equation as sort of as a discretization of a differential Pandeva equations. And uh, then it uh, was more systematically studied um, in. There was a foundational paper by Paul Georgiou and Frank Nyhoff and uh, Basil Grammaticus and Alfred Romani. And there were many uh, papers by Grammaticus and Romani and their collaborators who created lots and lots of examples of such equations. And uh, somewhat later um, in works of uh, Sakai um, and Japanese school, there was a um, geometric sort of foundation um, to the theory of discrete Pandeva equations that uh, helped us see uh, their true nature. Okay, so uh, similarly to differential Pandeva equation, um, it's difficult to give a definition of what a discrete Pandeva equation is. Uh, you don't write an equation and say, well, this is how it looks like. Okay, the, the, so the characteristic is uh, somewhat different. Also, you can see that there are some parameters in these equations. And you can think about them. Uh, so this is a good way of thinking about discrete Pandeva equations. You can think about them as mappings. So you have uh, some variables f and g, and you have parameters ai, and you map them to variables f bar, g bar, and parameters ai bar. So uh, parameters of the equation, they uh, uh, can change with the mapping in certain ways. Um, so um, uh, Grammaticus and Romani introduced something, uh, a notion of um, singularity confinement that I will not explain, but it was an attempt to give a discrete um, version of Pandeva property. Um, sort of very briefly, if you have a rational mapping, you can have a singularity appearing in the mapping. And if um, this singularity sort of disappears after a few iterations, this singularity is called confined. And um, what uh, they did, they um, looked at autonomous uh, discrete dynamical systems and um, try to deautonomize them and impose the singularity confinement condition and came up with a large number of examples of discrete Pandeva equations. Um, but um, uh, those examples to me were difficult to understand. I still, when uh, I look at these uh, papers where there are lots and lots of equations. Uh, I personally have a hard time feeling what an equation is about. So I very much uh, like the approach of Japanese school who um, developed the geometric theory of such equations. Um, and that is due to the work of... Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, principally uh, the state of the art is that this uh, confinement property is characteristic for discrete Pendleway equations or not, uh, I'm not. No, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, 
I think the right way of thinking about is uh, is this. So uh, singularity confinement property was originally thought to be an analog of integrability criteria. Uh, then turned out that it is not quite the case because uh, there are non-integrable systems, for example, in the sense of algebraic entropy, that uh, have satisfied the singularity confinement criteria. Um, and the state of the art is really Sakai's geometric theory. And I will say a few words about that and try to explain what the discrete Pendleve equation is from that point of view. Um, Singularity confinement. Uh, recently, there was an interesting series of work by uh, uh, Grammatica Sramani Willux, uh, uh, Maze, um, who uh, um, uh, were trying to sort of reach what they call redeem the singularity confinement approach. But I personally like the, the geometry a little bit better. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. I agree. Well, um, okay. So where is geometry? So um, well, basically, uh, this this is what's uh, what's happening. So we have some Pendleve equation, PK. This is a second order OD. So it's a second order OD. It can be written as a first order uh, two by two system. <coughs> okay, so um, let's uh, say that um, it is defined again in variables f and g. And then there is a variable t here. Okay, so um, we can think about this point as corresponding to some initial value of time t naught. And um, since we, we sort of want to understand the behavior of solutions, it is natural to think about a solution as being parameterized by its initial condition. Because locally, initial condition completely determines a particular solution, okay? So then this space here, uh, this space in variables f and g, that would be just c cross c, uh, corresponds to the space of initial conditions of the equation. But we also allow um, our equation to have movable poles, okay? so. So poles are allowed, and we need to be able to include them into our initial conditions. So uh, the way this is done, your C is compact, uh, compactified, and you get um, a compact al uh, algebraic surface P1 cross P1. OK, so oh, over here. But then. <laughs> Uh, there may be uh, certain uh, points appearing that uh, there, there are like two, two phenomena happening in this space of initial condition. Uh, one is um, there are points where sort of multiple trajectories start going through one, uh, that point, And this has to be fixed by what is called the blow up blow up procedure. Um, and what the blow up procedure does, it's essentially the following. If you have a point and uh, you have lines passing through this point, you separate those different lines by um, uh, lifting your trajectories according to the slope with which they go through the point. Okay, this is called the blow up. Call this projection pi over here. Um, so that modifies the geometry. Essentially, you take a point, and in this point, you glue in uh, a complex projective line of all possible slopes. 
it's some coordinate transformation. Uh, in uh, real variables, it looks like uh, a, a helix where you sort of uh, pull the lines that go through the point apart according to the slope. So that's one kind of things that uh, can occur. The other kind of things that can occur is that at certain points, so normally you have your uh, uh, time direction here and um, normally if you have a uh, initial condition, you have a trajectory that projects uh, on the time direction. Your flow is transversal to the space of initial conditions. But after you do this compactification, there are certain points where the motion uh, becomes what is called vertical. So you, you don't go in the time direction, you go vertically along this space of initial condition itself. So uh, this uh, curves are known, are called vertical leaves. And these points uh, usually lie on this vertical leaves. So uh, what you have to do to construct the meaningful space of initial conditions is uh, this. Um, you um, start with your C cross C and then you change it to P1 cross P1 and then and then you change it to uh, some complex algebraic surface X by doing this blow ups. And after you, you're done with this, you uh, will have certain configuration of vertical leaves. So this is vertical leaves. And um, your uh, space of initial conditions is a uh, complement to the vertical leaves, okay? So any true initial condition appears somewhere here. So that space is called Akamoto space of initial conditions. Okay. So this is uh, this part, okay? So that uh, notion is related to the classical um, a differential Pandeva equation. And um, Pandeva equations have symmetries called backlone transformations that uh, change your equation for one value of parameters to an equation for different values of parameters. Then um, what happens here is uh, this. Um, you have um, you have your time direction uh, here, and you have your parameters going in this way, and then uh, this is your uh, space of initial conditions x with some configuration of vertical leaves. So. In this direction, you have a family of different values of parameters. So maybe let me call B, uh, this parameter B, and this parameter is B bar, X B bar here. Um, so you have backlund transformations that map a space of initial conditions for one value of parameters to space of initial conditions for a different value of parameters. And uh, turns out that that's where discrete Penleve equations appear. They're particular combinations of backlund transformations um, that also have sort of a certain discrete time direction of motion. And that's the sort of the basic ideas of geometric theory. So 
uh -huh. excuse me, but is this uh, scheme is gen gen general? Mm -hmm. Yes, the scheme is completely general, and that's um, essentially what Sakai did in his uh, PhD dissertation. He basically uh, classified all possible algebraic surfaces that can occur, and also classified all possible discrete Pandeva equations that can occur. So, um, and the classification is geometric and is in terms of, and is given in terms of um, uh, affine Dinkin diagrams. So, what what happens is this: you have this configuration of vertical leaves, like over here, and to configuration of uh, vertical leaves uh, corresponds some uh, graph. Well, I don't know. Let's see. For example, you have some graph like this. This graph is known as. Um, mm, D51, for example, this is a Dinkin diagram. So this Dinkin diagram is also called the surface type of your equation. And um, there is a dual diagram. To this diagram, there is a dual uh, Dinkin diagram. And that corresponds to symmetry. Okay, uh, I'm trying to explain the big picture here. Uh, if you want details, uh, we, we can do that, but maybe it would be a different talk. And uh, so the theory of discrete Pandeva equations is essentially saying that um, to the symmetries corresponds some affine while group of this dual diagram, whatever it is. And in this affine while group, there are translation elements. You have your affine while group is like a group of uh, generated by reflections, um, but it also has like a whole uh, lattice uh, of reflections, like typical example, simple example can be, you can have a regular triangle lattice and you're thinking about all reflections in lines in this regular triangular lattice, okay? Um, and uh, sort of translation type motion in this lattice is a discrete Pandeva equation. So that's, that's that. So you have this uh, surface and uh, symmetry sub lattices and uh, that's the classification. So let me show you the complete classification scheme. So <laughs> this uh, classification scheme is based on symmetries. And uh, there is a dual scheme that is based on surface types. Okay, so Dim, I, I think this is an attempt to answer your question. What is the state of the art? That's mm -hmm. essentially the state of the art and the classification. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I put some letters yeah. here. This is uh, not ex exclusive, but basically, um, if you look here, you see Penleve 4, or oh, sorry, you have, you see Penleve 6 here, and it's a type of D41. What that means is that um, the um, uh, configuration of vertical leaves uh, that corresponds to uh, Pandeva six is described by is described by a Dinkin diagram that looks like this. Okay, so in other words, there is a vertical leaf uh, here, and uh, it intersects with this vertical leaf, this vertical leaf, uh, this. And there's something like that. Okay. Now, uh, in the uh, uh, dual uh, symmetry lattice, um, 
there are backlog transformations and a particular combination of uh, elementary backlog transformations give you a discrete Pendeva 5 equation that on one hand is a symmetry of Pendeva 6 and in the other hand has this continuous limit to the differential Pendeva 5. And in the differential Pendeva 5 you have a different surface type and again uh, there will be a particular type of backlog transformation that is called differential uh, discrete uh, difference pen level four that has then continuous limit to differential pen level four and so on and so forth. That's uh, Anton. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, does pen pen level five equation uh, uh, ordinary pen level five equation appears like some symmetry of pen level six equation? No. No, no, no. Discrete Pendeleve 5. Yes, yes, that's clear. Yeah. Okay. So, and um, what I wanted mainly to talk about today is about the notion of isomonodromy as it relates to the theory of Pendeleve equations. So, um, in the theory of integrable systems, it's well known that one of the key tools is a lax pair representation. And the lax pair representation can be thought of as um, you have some linear problem and you have some isospectral deformations of this linear problem and the compatibility conditions um, give you your nonlinear equation. Like this is classical KDV um, equation. Um, and isomonodromic deformation is a certain generalization of um, isospectral deformations. Um, and um, it's, it's classical theory that uh, differential Pendeleve equations uh, uh, appear as um, isomonodromic deformations of some second order linear equations on the Riemann sphere. So, for example, Pendeleve 6 um, occurs as an isomonodromy deformation of some Fuchsian system. Um, and then by you can do degenerations to get this representation for other differential Pendeleve equations. And um, what uh, we were interested in, and this project is uh, uh, quite old, frankly. Um, it was the idea of Sakai-san who wanted to see, maybe we can use isomonodromic theory to try to classify um, discrete, uh, um, higher order analogs of discrete Pendeleve equations. But for that, we needed to understand how isomonodromy works with discrete Pendeleve equations. And another uh, feature of classical isomonodromic deformations is that they're Hamiltonian. And we wanted to see if it's possible to do the same thing like discrete Hamiltonian for uh, discrete Pendeleve equations. Turns out that this can be done. So um, there are what is called Schlesinger equations that describe isomonodromic uh, deformations of uh, this linear systems. And they're Schlesinger transformations. How about I choose the one that doesn't have a spelling error? Um, and those Schlesinger transformations um, uh, give us discrete Pendeleve equations. And this is what I will try to explain. Okay. So let me begin with saying a few words about what an isomonodromy is, okay? So we begin with the following. We begin with this equation. So that's just a standard uh, linear equation. And um, this equation we think of as an equation on the Riemann sphere, CP1. And um, we want the coefficient matrix A of Z to be a rational function with at most with at most simple poles. So this is my uh, coefficient matrix of the system. Okay. Uh, so this is called the Schlesinger normal form of a Fuchsian system. Um, here AIs this matrix is AIs, are just the residues of this rational matrix function. Um, 
and that's a, our Fuchsian system. So Fuchsian system has something uh, that is called spectral data. And this spectral data consists of, uh, comes in two flavors rather. First, it's the poles of the coefficient matrix where our system is singular. And second is the spectrum of coefficient matrices at those poles. So this data is uh, continuous and this data is discrete in the following sense. Um, I will define what a monodromy is and um, isomonodromic deformations are deformations that preserve this monodromy of the system and you can uh, continuously deform the location of uh, poles but to deform the but the eigenvalues you have to shift by uh, some integer uh, shifts. So that's why I call this spectral data discrete. There's also an important notion of spectral type that is used for classification. And spectral type is essentially the type of degeneracies that you have in your eigenvalues. If you have multiple eigenvalues, that's encoded in the spectral type. Now, what's a monodromy? So um, if you start at some regular point away from this poles of the system, um, you can take a curve that um, goes around this bad point on the Riemann sphere, or maybe multiple bad points, but let's choose a simple curve that goes around just one, call it gamma. And then you know that your solution for every point, there's some neighborhood where your solution is analytic and you can do analytic continuation, start with um, basis of your solution here and analytically continue it. Um, then you don't necessarily come back to the basis where you started, but they would be related by some matrix. <coughs> this matrix is called the connection matrix. And um, those connection matrices is essentially what is called the monodromy. Or a little bit more precise, you um, look at the um, mapping from the fundamental group of our Riemann sphere minus this collection of uh, poles into a um, general linear group. And then um, you also introduce some modulo sum equivalences. Um, so to the path gamma, or rather it's a, a homotopy class, you put the class of the corresponding matrix C up to conjugation. And the isomonodromic deformation is uh, deformation of the singularity data, which is poles or characteristic indices, etc., that preserves this monodromy transformation. So the uh, continuous deformations are uh, given by the following. So you say, um, let my coefficient matrix, that is a rational function on Z, also depend on some parameters. So here, my parameters will be locations of poles. So I denoted by this script Z. And uh, then the question uh, is um, how to deform the coefficients. And you do that by introducing this deformation equation with respect to the parameter zi, to the ith pole. And then uh, <coughs> the compatibility condition of the original system and this deformation equation is called Schlesinger equation. Schlesinger equations. And these are equations on the uh, coefficients on the, on the residues of this uh, rational matrix function A. We have that. And uh, discrete uh, isomonodromy transformations known as Schlesinger transformations are some kind of gauge uh, type transformations. So <coughs> here I, use, I think about the parameters as uh, this uh, eigenvalues of coefficient matrices. And the question is on how you can um, 
on how you can sort of gauge your basis so that um, the eigenvalues shift in a particular way. So these transformations are called Schlesinger transformations. And uh, what we focused on, and that turned out to be enough as far as uh, discrete Pandava equations are concerned, um, we focused on very a special type of such transformations um, where the multiplier matrix, this, this matrix R that appears, has this particular form. So this type of matrices are sometimes called blaschke potapov matrices and that they're well known in soliton theory. They're used for dressing transformations, etc. So uh, the matrix has the following form. It is an identity matrix and uh, that is perturbed as a rational matrix function by some projector matrix P. Okay, so P is a projector. Um, here I choose two points alpha and beta, sorry, two indices alpha and beta, and I do the transformation that only affects uh, this uh, eigenvalues at points alpha and beta and doesn't change any of the others, okay? One nice property of such function, um, of such multiplier matrices is that the inverse matrix is essentially almost the same. And then you can write down the equation that connect the coefficient matrix of a new system and the coefficient matrix of the old system uh, through this multiplier matrix. Okay, and then um, you can look at uh, equations that connect this A bar matrices and usual matrices. Okay. Do, do you assume that the rank of projector of one? No, I don't. Then the inverse may be of a different form. Uh, well, I do assume a little bit on the projector. Um, actually, Sasha, I don't know. Uh, I, I assume, I have a certain semi-simplicity assumption on the project. So it's not necessarily rank one, but uh, there are some orthogonality conditions that I assume. Actually, you know, are, are you sure? Because I think if I just multiply these two matrices, then I get identity. Yes, no? yes, that's true. You multiply that, uh, you, you can get identity, yes. But uh, yeah, but you have, you can have, um, you can have what? You can have two different, uh, false. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. Okay, I, 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 I will think I'll tell you later. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you can solve these two uh, types of equations. This, you can solve them for the new matrices AI bar, and you get the equations that we uh, call discrete Schlesinger evolution equations. Okay. Um, there is also a notion of discrete Schlesinger equations that were given in a paper by uh, Borodin, for example, and those have continuous limits to the usual Schlesinger equations. And for us, these equations are just the equations uh, that uh, describe this Schlesinger transformations. Okay, so um, and when you write this down, you no you notice that there is a certain condition here on projectors. So um, for the transformation indices alpha and beta, if you look at the projector P and its complementary projector Q, so you see Q is identity minus P, they need to satisfy these conditions, okay? And then the question is, how can we find a projector matrix that satisfies this condition and also changes the indices the way we want them to change. 
Um, uh, to prove that is uh, standard, you basically, you write down, like you take this equation, you write it down and you have this two equations and then you take residues. You look at the um, terms of order two, uh, poles of order two, and uh, you look at uh, other poles, zi, different from alpha, beta, and etc. And then you get this, then you get this equation. And the question then is on how to construct these projectors. And um, what you want to do is you want to go from the space of coefficients to a larger space that is called the decomposition space. That is essentially a space of eigenvectors. So uh, we impose here a, a semi-simplicity assumption on our matrix that it is diagonalizable, um, has certain rank, right? and uh, that there is a full set of eigenvectors. Okay. So we put Bij to be uh, eigenvectors of matrix Ai with eigenvalues theta Ij. These are column eigenvectors and also they're row eigenvectors. And we um, create this eigenvector matrices. And then uh, it's easy to see that our coefficient matrix AI can be written as a product of this matrix of column eigenvectors and the matrix of row eigenvectors. Um, so the decomposition uh, space is the space of all these uh, pairs equipped with a standard symplectic structure. And um, the motivation for looking at this space is going all the way back to the classical paper by uh, Jim Bamiwa Morisato of the 80s, who showed that uh, Hamiltonian form for Schlesinger equations, <coughs> um, that Schlesinger equations have natural Hamiltonian form uh, repre or representation on that space. So the Hamiltonian itself is written explicitly here and the symplectic structure is a standard symplectic structure. Um, and turns out that the same is true in the discrete case as well. So uh, here is an explicit example um, of the Hamiltonian structure for van der Waals equation. So that's an explicit Hamiltonian. What we wanted to do, we wanted to have the same thing for discrete. Okay. So first question is how to construct the projector matrix. And uh, if you only work with rank one, in other words, you have uh, points alpha, beta, and you choose two indices, one in the index mu at the point Z alpha and index nu at the point Z beta, uh, these two indices. And you want to shift one of these eigenvector values down by one and one of the eigenvalues and the corresponding one up by one then the projector matrix is a classical one. So it's essentially the column vector of a column eigenvector at the point beta multiplied by the row eigenvector at the point alpha divided by something to make it a projector. Okay. Seminario. Okay. Um, and I think that's related to Sasha's question, but actually you can do it for arbitrary rank. Uh, still choose two points. So I have the point Z alpha and Z beta. These are the points for my transformation. But I also choose a sub collection of indices at each of these points. And without loss of generality, you can say R indices, the first R indices here and the first R indices here. And uh, then you can put primes for the indices of the transformations and double primes for the indices that do not participate in the transformation and break the matrices B and C according to wh whether we change or we don't change the corresponding eigenvalues. 
And then here is the projector matrix. So projector matrix is cooked up from um, column vectors at the point beta and row vectors at the point alpha. And to make it a projector matrix, uh, you need to, to insert uh, this matrix in between. And we assume that this matrix is indeed invertible, like the inverse of C alpha dagger B beta. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, I sometimes may use the notation of this indices F and G, where I take this inverse matrix in the middle and attach it either here or here. Okay. I will not explain why this is a correct projector matrix. It's pretty straightforward, but you can show that if you do the uh, gauge transformation with this uh, projector matrix, then indeed your eigenvectors corresponding to prime indices at the point alpha shift down by one and um, eigenvector indices corresponding to uh, point beta shift up by one and you also can find the corresponding eigenvectors. Okay. So, and then there are two things that you can do. So basically what I just explained is this, that if you do discrete transformation um, and you want a particular thing to happen to your uh, spectral data, <clears throat> um, I gave you the multiplier matrix for these transformations and also said that here are my equations. <coughs> but I'm lifting my system to this larger decomposition space. So I need to tell you how the equations work um, on the decomposition space and it's possible to do. So explicitly you can show what's happening for the eigenvectors. So this is the evolution of eigenvectors. There's some normalization constants and uh, essentially away from the transformation indices, uh, it's very simple. You just uh, adjust your um, old eigenvectors by the um, multiplier matrix at the corresponding uh, point or the inverse for row eigenvectors. But for Alpha indices alpha and beta, you have rather complicated uh, formulas. But everything is very explicit. What is very interesting is that in addition to this evolutionary form, you can also write uh, this um, equations in the discrete Hamiltonian form in complete parallel to what's happening in the differential case. But first I need to say a few words about what I mean by discrete Hamiltonian formalism. And uh, I basically learned uh, about it from a very nice paper by Marsden and West. So this is what you can do. If you go from continuous uh, dynamics to discrete dynamics, you go from your cotangent bundle to a configuration space, which is a square uh, to the square of the configuration space. And there you can uh, write down the Lagrangian function. And if you have a trajectory in the configuration space, um, you can associate action to this trajectory with the help of this Lagrangian function. And you end up with a discrete Euler Lagrange equation for this dynamics using the um, action minimizing or the standard variational principle. And then you get the discrete Lagrangian flow that given two points in the trajectory computes the next point in the trajectory. Um, and then it's possible to sort of do the uh, analog of the continuous case. You do the uh, Legendre transform to go from Lagrangian uh, formulation to the Hamiltonian formulation. Uh, there, uh, there is a symplectic form associated uh, to your uh, uh, structure. And you can do Legendre transform that um, 
well, rather left and right Legendre transform something like this. There are the formulas. And um, you can define a Hamiltonian flow with the help of this transform on the cotangent space. So here Q is the point in configuration space and P is the momentum. And then there are various generating functions that you can associate to this flow and the flow will be a uh, canonical transformation and you will have uh, two generating functions for this canonical transformation or two types. In the Lagrangian formulation, you can get momenta uh, from uh, positions. In the, in the Hamiltonian, you choose either right Hamiltonian that is defined on QK and PK plus one, and then you can get from it QK plus one and PK. So he, here is an attempt to sort of draw the picture. So our uh, Schlesinger transformations are from coefficients AI to coefficients AI bar. And we're working with this indices alpha, beta, um, you know. So um, I go from coefficients to, the, to some subspace of the decomposition space. And the subspace that I choose is the one that uh, has the correct eigenvalues and there's some conditions on the residue at infinity. And I want to write down a function somewhere here. This is function is called my discrete Hamiltonian, such that, uh, so, and you see the function is defined on B and C bar, such that its B derivative gives me uh, C and its C bar derivative gives me B bar. Okay, so if I can, do that, this is called the discrete Hamiltonian of my system. It's uh, not clear why this discrete Hamiltonian would exist, but it does. So let's be a little bit more specific. So we choose uh, poles Z1, Zn. So we fix these parameters. We fix spectral type. We pick up characteristic indices. We pick up two different uh, points on which the transformation is based choose the rank of a transformation, choose corresponding transformation indices, and we want to construct a generating Hamiltonian function such that our indices transform in this way. And we can recover from a pair of B, C bar, B bar and C by differentiating this Hamiltonian function. So, we go back to the equations of uh, Schlesinger transformations that we saw earlier, but uh, before the projector P, this projector was written in terms of uh, B and C. And now I want to write this projector P in terms of B and C bar. So things change a little bit, but it's still possible to do that will be a very similar formula, only now you see that uh, only points beta occur here. Um, and we need to choose a certain subspace where everything works. Um, and uh, then first thing is that we can solve for the indices B bar and C. And uh, for most of the indices, the formulas would be quite simple. For the transformation indices, again, most of them will be quite simple, except for um, this pairs. Um, uh, the, this expressions would be very, very complicated. But uh, there is a generating function such that if you differentiate this function with the corresponding variables, we get exactly this equations. Okay, so 
I realize that looking at the synthesis makes your head hurt, but uh, the, the main message should be clear that there is a Hamiltonian, discrete Hamiltonian version of Schlesinger transformations in complete parallel. Okay. All right. So let me go back to discrete Pendeva equations and sort of review the motivation. So here is the classification scheme again. And you can see that <coughs> a part of this classification scheme, um, you have differential Pendeva equations occur, appearing. And then there is a purely discrete part. Um, and sort of philosophically, you can say, well, okay, they're discrete Pendeva equations because they fit into the Sakai definition of what a discrete Pendeva equation is. But uh, I think uh, Sakai-san and Takinawa-san, they wanted to sort of have a closer connection also between this differential part and discrete part. What do they have in common in addition to geometry? And they actually all occur as uh, isomonodromic transformations of uh, Fuchsian systems. Mm. Here, I need, I need to say that the reason this uh, classification scheme is sort of written in three levels is because very top you have elliptic um, discrete system. Uh, here you have Q and here you have D. The central row is um, a multiplicative uh, system where the evolution on the space of parameters is by multiplication by some parameter Q. And the bottom row corresponds to uh, difference equations where evolution on the space of parameters is by shifts. Okay. All right, so let me maybe say a few words about these examples. So in this purely uh, discrete part, there are three types of examples corresponding to surfaces A0, A1, and A2, and symmetries A7 and 6. And um, in the paper by Philip Bolch, uh, he wrote down the spectral type of corresponding Fuchsian systems. So we sort of know what gives us the kind of corresponding discrete Pendleve equations. Um, but we wanted to write down explicit equations and compare them with standard examples. Now, if you look here, you see that um, this system, you have multiple eigenvec um, eigenvalues. So if you look at transformations, if you do any shift in this um, characteristic indices, it has to be a projector matrix of higher rank, not rank one, but rank two. And in this case, it would have to be a matrix of rank three. So that's why we uh, were aiming at developing this uh, formalism for uh, multiplier matrices of projectors of arbitrary rank. Okay. Um, so let's see. Mm. I've been talking for over an hour. I have two, two examples to look at. <laughs> I don't know. Principally, it's okay, but I have some questions about the Hamiltonian, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Hamiltonian structure. Uh, what do you prefer after the examples or now? No, let's. Um, well, yeah. They're philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's 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 go with questions because. Uh -huh. So I I not quite understand the 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 benefit of the Poisson uh, of the Hamiltonian interpretation of discrete uh, Pendleva equations of discrete isomonodromic deformations. Could you say some words? Mm. The benefits. Well, uh, uh, it 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 uh, uh, it helps to construct some some integrals, some symmetries, some. Uh, uh, is there some uh, possibility to quantize this uh, this uh, 
this uh, problem to uh, uh, I think most of your philosophical questions I would not be able to answer <laughs> okay. um, and there is also a certain caveat that I have to make explicit I think it was difficult to, to see it um, you see the Hamiltonian is written on this larger decomposition space so what happens is you write down the system of decomposition space, there is still some gauge action. And when you mod out by this gauge action, you end up with the true Panlever variables. <coughs> okay? So um, in the differential case, there is a reduction procedure that sort of pushes you down all the way. Okay. And here we don't have that. So that, that is an essential step that needs to be done before we can talk about this Hamiltonian formulation being useful in the sense that you asked about. But in the other sense, uh, it is useful because if you want to uh, try to use this isomonodromic approach as a way to think about classification theory, so there is a classification by Ashima of um, Fuchsian systems according to the spectral type of the corresponding matrices. And then if this formalism works on two dimensions, maybe it will work on higher dimensions as well. And what we're getting should be something that reduces to higher order analogs of Pendeva equations. And I think that this was the motivation behind um, Sakai san um, asking that question of can we write down the Hamiltonian function? Mm -hmm. And we can. And uh, here, notice that the Hamiltonian function that I wrote is completely general. So it doesn't just apply for cases when you have a um, two dimensional space of accessory parameters for your Fuchsian system, it's just arbitrary. But it's written on this larger space, so decomposition space. <coughs> so if you want something more concrete, there's still work to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me try to show an example. So mm -hmm. here's one example. Um, so let's uh, take this uh, Fuchsian system. So we only have uh, two points, zero and one, okay? Um, so if, if you think about uh, P6 from the point of isomonodromic deformations, you have um, a system with uh, of um, two by two matrices uh, with four singular points. So if you have four singular points, you can put them into zero, one, and infinity. And the fourth one uh, would be your time t, and that will, one will be with deformations, right? So that's where the continuous deformation is, and that's where you can get uh, Pandeva 6. But if you only have two points, then you can normalize them to be zero and one. There are no continuous deformations, but Schlesinger transformations still exist, and we do get discrete Pandeva equations. So, so we have these two points and I want three by three matrices. Uh, and rank of each point AI is equal to two. Now, notice that mm, I somehow was able to get rid of uh, one of the eigenvalues at each of these points. There is a scalar gauge transformation that can push it to infinity. So here I have zero and one, but there is also a point infinity. In fact, there is a infinity here. So then this would be the corresponding Riemann scheme for the Fuchsian system. So I have two non-zero eigenvalues here, two non-zero eigenvalues here, three non-zero eigenvalues at infinity. And uh, there is a Fuchs relation over here. And I want to see what these equations will give me. So uh, and that's um, 
what what I meant when when I said that there's still gauging involved. Um, you can use this gauging to uh, normalize the uh, eigenvector matrices. Like you can use a global gauge, for example, to uh, make these three vectors uh, standard basis. Okay. Um, and then you have four parameters, alpha, beta, uh, have parameters alpha, beta, gamma, and delta that uh, occur. But then there are also some relations. Um, this relations impose two constraints on these four parameters. And then their true number of parameters in the system is two. So you can introduce this variables x and y. Um, and alpha and beta can be written in terms of x and y. So, and then Schlesinger evolution gives, gives me this equation. So that's, that's a pretty complicated system because notice that, uh, I mean, it's, it's a rational function in variables x and y, but there are also uh, parameters alpha and beta and in parameters alpha and beta also depends on x and y and inside alpha and beta there are this R1, oops, there are R1 and R2 and R1 and R2 also are pretty complicated. So that's that's a complicated mapping, but it turns out that um, this is a discrete band of equation, like a standard one. Mm. Then there are like a couple of pages on <coughs> um, how you can recognize this equation as a discrete band of equation. And turns out that by a good change of variables, it can be mapped uh, to this discrete point of equation, and that one is a standard one. But I don't think I, I would be able to explain how that works. But here is this explicit change of variables that goes uh, from, from this dynamics to this dynamics. And another example um, was, uh, What I want to do. Ah, another example was um, this example where you still have three matrices, but now the matrices are four by four, like this. And here we try to see if we can recognize the standard example as a composition of Schlesinger transformations. And turned out that uh, yes, uh, we can we could do that. but it was quite uh, uh, complicated and also involved, you know, this higher, higher rank indices, okay? I don't think I want to go into any details about uh, any of this because it's really it's like a separate story. Uh, yes, yes. And uh, for people who know what it is about, they probably most of them heard me talk about this. For people who don't, I don't think they will be able to really figure out. But I would be happy to give maybe a more elementary talk about discrete pandemic proper. So th this one really was uh, based on Dima's uh, question about isomonodromy as it relates to uh, discrete Pandev equations. And I hope that that part I at least explained a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, perfectly suited the initial goal. Uh, Anton, could you say uh, about the elliptic case? So the isomonodromic transformation in the, on the elliptic curve uh, 
Is it Hamiltonian? Uh, that I don't know. So this whole thing is really done in the bottom part uh, for uh, difference equations. We tried doing something in the Q case and I think we hit a stumbling block and then something moved to something else. So it's sort of clear what to do in the Q case. Uh, and I haven't been paying attention, maybe something's already been done, but on, on that level, it didn't work out. The equations that we got, I couldn't solve. So, um, I mean, and elliptic case, I just have no idea, frankly, what's what's happening there. Um, here, um, I I don't want. Sorry, just go back here. There's this very famous example of uh, <coughs> QP six due to Jimbo uh, Sakai. And they got it as isomonodromy as well of the Q system. So you have something uh, Y at QT is A of T, something like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And isomonodromy. Anton, very interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> if not, I'd like to thank the, all, all the participants and the speaker again. Uh, Sash, let me ask, um, did you answer your question about higher rank at all? Yes, you did. Yes, yeah, you were right. I, you know, I just jumped from one seminar to another. I did not <laughs> completely <Okay>. settled. <laughs> so. But uh, the question was, you know, important about the rank, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's, it's important, uh, but uh, you, you are right. You are, you are absolutely right, yeah. It was actually surprising for me that everything worked out in higher rank. I didn't expect that. Yeah, so yeah. rank one was pretty straightforward once we understood how to do this type of computations. But, but uh, uh, I remember I had a discussion with your former supervisor is Igor Krichever about the ranks, you know, and the soliton dressing. Mm -hmm. And he says that why we need to study higher rank sol solitons. It's, it's not generic, you know, you should study rank one and take, you know, the kind of uh, continuous limit. To, you can always get higher rank solution as a limit of rank one solution. Right, but I don't think it's true in the discrete case, actually. It is probably true, but maybe it's not, not very productive. I mean, uh, because sometimes a, a direct formula found for uh, uh, for higher rank is much more, is simpler and, uh, you know, you, you can see more than, than, than doing this tricky analysis and the limits. Oh, right, right. Yeah, that, I, I, I really and, think, uh, I'm sorry, uh, sir. Yeah, yeah, and that is one thing. Another thing I, I, I noticed uh, working with Volodya Sokolov, it's still unpublished, uh, that when we try to uh, find soliton solutions or dressing for uh, the, these exceptional Lie algebras, that uh, in some cases, like in G2, for instance, uh, there are no solutions of rank one. There is no, you cannot find a consistent rank one dressing, but rank two exists. Mm -hmm. So that that that's what uh, I, I I want to add to, to to my point. But but no, you were right. I I, I was a, a little bit you know to mm -hmm. no, 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 it's, it's, asking questions. <laughs> it's, 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 it's okay. Yeah. Uh, again, I don't know how. At the end of the day, how useful the whole thing is. I think it's useful conceptually. That there is like some uniform foundation for all of this, but practically, I don't know. And if you want to write down discrete Pendeve equations, uh, geometry and birational representation of affine wild groups is the correct approach. N not through isomonodromy. But if you want to sort of see how different pieces fit together, then I think that this is helpful. That 
this there is this unified perspective. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Mm -hmm.